Referring to our ancient text, Joshua 6.20 says that on the seventh day, at the sound of the trumpets, the wall collapsed. And the uh, Bible is very specific in how it uh, describes that event. Uh, the Hebrew wording there is the walls uh, fell beneath themselves. And on the seventh trip around, we're told in the Bible, the mud brick wall collapsed and it fell outward and down to the base of the stone retaining wall. And when the archaeologists dug in this area, they found this pile of mud bricks all the way along the retaining wall. So where I am right now is where the pile of red bricks were found. That's correct. The Germans, Garstang, and Kenyon all found these piles of collapsed mud bricks while excavating at the base of the stone retaining wall. If you have a, wall, a brick wall sitting on top of a stone revetment and it falls over, what, where else can the bricks go? Um, they've got to go to the bottom. And so with that, with that pile of bricks, what does that what does that tell us? Does that tell us that there was a destruction of the wall? Well, certainly. It certainly is evidence of that destruction. These fallen bricks from the city wall can be seen in this diagram from Kenyon's excavation report. In her write-up, she makes it clear that it was not the stone retaining wall that fell, but rather the mud brick wall that once stood on top of it. And so she writes that up in her report that uh, here we have a, a collapsed city wall. And here's the evidence for it. The archaeological understanding of how the walls of Jericho fell matches well with the ancient description of the wall falling beneath itself. This find of a collapsed city wall found here at Jericho is unique in archaeology. At no other site have we found evidence for a city wall that has fallen down. Yes, there were remains of the mud brick that had fallen down. I mean, that wall came tumbling down. So the Bible says that the wall came tumbling down. The archaeologists then came and dug Jericho. And what did they find? They found a collapsed city wall. This fits perfectly with the description from the ancient text. And when you have that text, and you have the archaeology, and you can fit them together, then you have the evidence from both sides, the literary evidence and the actual uh, physical evidence from what the Bible is talking about. Another interesting detail regarding the walls of Jericho is found in Joshua 6.20. It says that after the walls collapsed, the Israelites went up into the city. Kidian's excavation report shows that the pile of fallen mud bricks could have been used as a ramp by the charging Israelites. So what Kenyon's report says is that that mud brick wall collapsed off of this foundation and it went all the way up to the top of the rim there and it formed a, it formed a ramp like this so that when the charging army would come they could have run up into the city to attack it. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what the Bible says. Each man went before him straight up into the city, and they could do that by just climbing up over that pile of collapsed mud bricks, up over the top of the stone retaining wall, up the embankment, and into the city. Joshua 6.24 then tells us that the Israelites burned the whole city and everything in it. To understand what a burned city would look like in a tell, let's return for a moment to our cake analogy. This chocolate layer represents a city that was destroyed by fire. Ooh. A burned layer stands out from the other layers of a cake, just as a burned city stands out when a tell is excavated. Now just as we can remove a slice from a cake to expose the inner structure of the cake, the same thing is true for a tell. As this trench was dug, this burn layer that you see right here was exposed. When Kathleen Kenyon came in the 1950s, she opened up uh, actually five squares in this area to kind of check Garstang's findings to see if she came up with the same results he found, because he found evidence for a massive destruction by fire. And he, of course, equated that to the biblical account because the Bible says the Israelites charged up into the city and then they set it on fire. So she opened up these squares and uh, she found exactly the same sequence that Garstang had found. Uh, 
vast destruction layer, about three feet thick of destruction debris, ash, collapsed roof timbers, and all kinds of things. Now in this burn layer, both Garstang and Kinion found room after room of large storage jars that were full of grain, and all of it was burned. Uh, yes, the uh, burnt wheat found there at Jericho is very important because it uh, ties in with our biblical story. Joshua 3.15 tells us that when the Israelites crossed the Jordan, it was at flood stage because it was during harvest time. And we see in Joshua 5.10 that after crossing the Jordan River, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. Uh, it tells us in the Bible when the Israelites crossed the Jordan River, it was at flood stage because it was harvest time. Well, in the southern Jordan Valley, harvest time is in the spring of the year. Would you agree with uh, some of Wood's arguments as far as the wheat that was found there, that it at least tells us some basic information as far as what time of year uh, the city was destroyed? Yes, it, 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 his assumptions, I think, are reasonable. Those um, containers, those pots were full of grain. Therefore, it must, they must be filled fairly soon after the harvest. We know that the Israelites came into the land and attacked Jericho in the spring of the year after Passover. And that's the same time of year as it is right now in Israel. All over Israel, they're celebrating Passover, and the people are bringing the wheat harvest in from the fields. And so we know both agriculturally and archaeologically that Jericho was attacked after the wheat harvest had been taken in. Now this is a very unusual find because grain was valuable. Why would you leave it to be burned up? Joshua 6.18 tells us that while destroying Jericho, the Israelites were commanded to keep away from the devoted things. Just the very fact that the grain was left to be destroyed in the fire tells us also uh, that uh, the Israelites obeyed God's command not to plunder the city. They're simply to offer up Jericho as an offering to the Lord as the first fruits of the promised land. The battle for Jericho is one of the most memorable stories in the Bible. And since the Bible is our only ancient account for Jericho, and since the details in the text match so well with the archaeological evidence found here, then the best conclusion that we can draw is that at the time of Joshua's conquest, the walls of Jericho really did come tumbling down. Excavations throughout the Nile Delta have unearthed walls of mud brick resembling those the Bible states were once molded by the hands of Israelite slaves. This practice was vividly illustrated in an 18th dynasty tomb painting depicting foreign slaves making bricks from mud and straw. An inscription on the mural echoes the slave master's dreaded warning. The rod is in my hand. Be not idle. Another mural, carved in a tomb wall during the 15th century BC, shows Canaanite slaves working in the vineyards of Goshen. 
and fragments of the Brooklyn papyrus, dating back more than 3,700 years, report the transfer of domestic slaves from one Egyptian owner to another. Each slave was listed by name. More than half the names noted were characteristically Hebrew. There is now little doubt that a significant Israelite population lived in Egypt for several hundred years after the time of Joseph. Yet if biblical accounts of the Exodus are historically viable, then there should also be evidence of Israel's arrival in Canaan, the Promised Land, sometime between the 14th and 12th centuries BC. Such evidence does exist. More than 3,200 years ago, the pharaoh Merneptah ventured out of Egypt on a military campaign through the land of Canaan. Later, in a poem proclaiming his victories, he boasted that Israel is laid waste. This inscription dates from about 1210 BC and establishes that the Israelites had arrived and settled in Canaan well before Merneptah's conquest at the end of the 13th century. Additionally, at Tel Amarna in Egypt, archaeologists have uncovered a series of letters on cuneiform tablets. Many were authored by Canaanite rulers early in the 14th century BC. These letters contain desperate pleas to the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten for military assistance to defend Canaan from nomadic invaders. One of them warns that if Pharaoh does not act, all Canaan will be lost. The invaders were identified by the name Apiru. And this is kind of a generic term for stateless individuals, people who uh, weren't connected with any particular urban center. And so the Israelites undoubtedly would have been referred to as either Apiru or Asiatics by the Egyptians. I do think that the term Apiru is the origin of the term Hebrew. If the name Apiru referred to the Hebrew people, then the Tel Armana inscriptions provide strong evidence for the presence of Israel in Canaan. They also suggest Israel may have entered the country earlier than scholars had previously thought at the beginning of the 14th century BC. Recent excavations of the Canaanite city of Hatzor could also support a 14th century Israelite invasion. Evidence has been uncovered that the city was destroyed at least twice during the period described in the biblical books of Joshua and Judges. Scattered among the remains of a large palace were Egyptian and Canaanite idols, their heads and hands intentionally chiseled off. Archaeologist Amnon Bentor has concluded by process of elimination that the invading Israelites must have ravaged Hatzor, for neither the Egyptians nor the indigenous Canaanites would have purposely destroyed their own gods. So we should expect to find evidence in Canaan for the conquest. And when we uh, examine some of the places that are named in the book of Joshua, we do indeed find archaeological evidence to back up the biblical account.